So, 2 Samuel chapter 18. And uh, as we said before we jump in, let's do a bit of a recap. Uh, just a bit of refresher uh, for those who are with us. It's been probably about four weeks since the last time we're in the book. And so we've taken a bit of a break for various reasons. Uh, in our last couple of studies, we saw the events that occurred in David's life as he was fleeing Jerusalem uh, with the servants of 600 uh, Philistines who had come with him when he moved into uh, back into Israel when he was fleeing uh, from his son Absalom, uh, who had abandoned, uh, um, you know, where... He was trying to uh, take over the kingdom. Uh, he uh, manipulated the people that were supposed to come to David. And so he met with them outside the city gates and says, Oh, I can hear your case. And if I was king, I would be dealing with this and that. So he spent years developing this and eventually he developed this coup. And so um, what ended up happening is David was fleeing from his son Absalom, who uh, again mounted this huge insurrection against him to take over the throne. And um, he was lied to and uh, was deceived by a guy named Ziba. And then there's another man that we were introduced to in that chapter uh, by Shimei. And he began to walk alongside David and his men. And they were throwing rocks at them and cursing them and accusing them of all kinds of stuff and saying, oh, you're a bloody man because uh, he was a man of bloodshed. And then we saw how David restrained him, uh, his men uh, from retaliating against Shimei uh, for this act. And David allowed uh, this man to continue doing this because he realized that perhaps maybe Shimei was cursing him and throwing rocks at David uh, was part of uh, the Lord's chastening him because of his sin in his past with David and uh, with uh, Bathsheba and, and his murder of uh, Uriah. Then we also observed another guy named Hushai. Uh, he was one of David's loyal servants. Uh, he was a counselor and a man who remained with Absalom uh, in the palace in order to spy on Absalom uh, for David. Uh, and he foiled the counsel of Ahithophel uh, and thus uh, averted David and his men from being slaughtered by Absalom and his band of mercenaries. So Ahithophel originally was a date with David, but then he joined sides to be with Absalom. Absalom, and he was supposed to give Absalom some wise counsel, which was ultimately to um, try to uh, hurt David. Uh, so uh, Hushai was one of those guys to, uh, as a spy to change the counsel. Uh, so he'd give a different counsel to uh, Absalom. And uh, Ahushai was a master at uh, metaphors, and, and God used his skillful way with words to actually defeat Absalom. And so he compared David to this angry bear in verse 8 of chapter 17, and also a fierce lion in chapter 10. So this is describing David's character and how he's going to be because of all that he's going through. And then he appealed to Absalom's pride by telling him to lead a large army like the sand as verse 11 mentions, and defeat David himself upon uh, coming upon David men as, a, as the dew falls, as verse 12 mentions. And so Absalom pictured himself as this conquering general, and pride did the rest to him. You know, went to his head, yeah, I can do this. Um, and so David uh, owed his life to the brave men who actually stayed behind in Jerusalem and kept the king informed of Absalom's plan. And also there are some anonymous women who protected the messengers when they fled from when they got found out. So there's these women that protected these men. And so the people who helped him uh, ultimately was a gift from God. And so behind all the great leaders are devoted people whom God rewards, but there are some names that you don't remember or know of. There's people who were very instrumental that we never hear of, but if it wasn't for them, uh, the success of some of the other people that are prominent never are, you know, get known. Now, Absalom started his political career uh, with his vanity, with his charisma, uh, and his popularity. And instead of depending upon God uh, and his will uh, and guidance, uh, he used manipulation. He used uh, violence and his personal charm to attract people to his side. And that's the way you see the difference with how uh, David led versus Absalom. Absalom is a type of Satan uh, when you look through the different typologies and scriptures. And so even though uh, his dying fate is written in the, the wall, this rebel prince, um, Absalom, 
is heading to his first and really his last battle against David's army, which is far superior in combat skills, as we'll see. Now, in our study this evening, we're going to see that when David and his men go into battle against Absalom uh, and his forces, that uh, Absalom is killed in this battle. Uh, it wasn't by anyone's hands except for um, uh, ultimately Absalom's hands, but then we do see a situation that arise that ends up killing him. Um, we'll also see the process that occurs as David then accepts uh, back into Israel again to resume the, the reign as king. So now he's going from exile, now going back into because people want him as king. So with that as a bit of a refresher and backdrop, let's dive into our study. Verse 1, And David numbered the people who were with him, and set captains of thousands and captains of hundreds over them. And then David sent out one-third of the people under the hand of Joab, uh, one-third under the hand of Abishai, the son of Zariah, Joab's brother, and one-third under the hand of Ittai, the Gittite. And the king said to the people, I will also surely go out with you myself. But the people answered, says, you shall not go out, for if we flee away, they will not care about us, nor if half of us die, they will not care about us. But you are worth 10,000 of us now, for you are now more help to us in the city. And then the king said to them, whatever seems best to you, I will do. So the king stood beside the gate, and all the people went out by the hundreds and thousands. Now, as we left chapter 17, there's the civil war that's about to happen in Israel. And this whole scene takes place in a town called Mehenem, uh, as chapter 17, verse 24 mentions. And so this gated city where David and this large entourage uh, were based, uh, it's kind of the northeast uh, of um, Jerusalem. That's probably a good 100 Ks from that particular location outside the territory of the land of Israel. Now, on one side, you have this exile king, David, uh, several thousand people who left with him. And on the other side, um, led by um, Absalom. And the majority of Israel, unfortunately, sided with Absalom uh, after years of deception and manipulation. And we know from verse 1 that the number of uh, so soldiers loyal to David is in the thousands, but we also get the impression it's less than 10,000. So that's kind of between uh, 1 to 9 plus thousand people that are uh, there. In chapter 17, Absalom decides to rise up this large army and go after David. And, and there, uh, this time gap between chapter 17 and chapter 18 while uh, Absalom is raising this army. Now, as we see here, David assigns his troops and sets them in proper organization. Uh, so he divided his forces into three groups, uh, three generals in charge of them. And dividing them into multiple companies for fighting is actually a tactic uh, that's been used ever since uh, in fighting war. So it was a brilliant strategy and, and as, a, uh, as a, a warrior, David uh, understood that. So this approach, again, keeps you from, if you will, having all your eggs in one basket instead of having just one big, large troop. You know, they split it up into three groups. So you can come to different sides. If one group is needing help, another one can come alongside. And so as we see Abishai, uh, Joab, and Ittai were these three generals uh, who had a third of the companies placed. And wisely, the people refused to allow their king to go out with them. It wasn't wise for him to do that. And, um, and, and since they know that if David goes out to battle, and Absalom's army would focus primarily on uh, killing him, knowing that if David's dead, then all the resistance will be squashed. So David, he doesn't argue with this logic and, and his troops. And that's one of the great principles that you'll learn in leadership is a good leader knows when and how to receive good advice. And although David's not to take part in the fighting, he's still heavily involved in this situation. He's standing, as you saw there, beside the gate. So he's watching each soldier as they march out and uh, would have given their focus and attention and also probably to boost their morale. Verse 5 continues, And now the king had commanded Joab, Abishai, and Ittai, saying, Deal gently for my sake with young Absalom. And all the people heard. Then the king gave all the captains orders concerning Absalom. So here we're seeing David's asking his generals, be nice to him, be kind to him. You know, don't kill him, essentially. And as we've already mentioned in the previous 
studies of how David loved Absalom uh, above anything else on this earth. And so he had this um, unhealthy uh, view of Absalom and his love for him. And again, there's a father's love, but this seemed to go uh, beyond that. And um, he intended to have Absalom succeed him as king one day. Absalom just needed to wait his time, but he tried to jump the process. And it occurs that even at this point, David thought that Absalom's chance that Absalom could still become king over Israel. He's still, you know, wanting that to happen. And David appears to think that this insurrection, perhaps by Absalom, is just kind of childish prank rather than a real threat. Uh, you never think that of your, your children, that they're going to come and try to wipe you out. And notice that of all the people who heard uh, David charge his generals, they heard it. They listened to what was being said to the generals. Um, and, and here's somewhat I would think would be disheartening uh, for David's army uh, to see, to hear their leader, leader given this uh, um, much affection to this rebellious, godless man who instigated this rebellion to take over the kingdom and over the throne. And the problem is, is that with rebellion like this, there's only one way it can end, either with the death of David or the death of Absalom. And so they're thinking, uh, you know, David should have been firm. He should have been ruthless. You know, this should never have happened. If it wasn't for his son, uh, if it was any other person, he would have been probably ruthless. And just like when we face sin in our lives, we can't deal with them in kindness or uh, in gentleness. We got to cut it off, anything with sin in our lives. And remember, God cares more about our character than our comfort. Also, David is giving specific orders to his three generals not to kill Absalom, as we mentioned. And so this uh, became important in a few verses that we're going to see how General uh, Joab actually disobeys this particular order. Uh, so this verse shows the dilemma that King David is going through. Uh, his own son is rebelling against him, so he wants to kill him. But at the same time, and despite that, David loves his son and wants him to be alive. So that's a very difficult position uh, for him to be in. Verse 6 goes on to say, So the people went out to the fields of the battle against Israel, and the battle was in the woods of Ephraim. And so the people of Israel were overthrown there before the servants of David, and a great slaughter of 20,000 took place there that day. For the battle there was scared, uh, scattered all over the face of the whole countryside, and the woods devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. So as we see in these three verses is really what the battle entails itself. So David's army slaughtered, notice that, 20,000 of Absalom's men. They fought against them in the forest of Ephraim. Now think about that. 20,000 men died there. And none of this would have been necessary if Absalom didn't um, rebel and put himself in this position. And remember, Absalom was next in line to be king. He just needed to wait his time, you know, and to, to serve in that particular uh, situation. Now, this battle took place in a thick wooded forest. And the text says that the forest, the wooded area, killed more than the sword. Um, I don't believe that uh, it means that uh, all the soldiers died from running into trees. Um, I suspect that the soldiers were running, perhaps got caught in the thicket aspects of the wood, possibly in some pits, um, and uh, they became possibly easy prey for the other side. Um, it also shows the military shrewdness of David's uh, army as well and his men. The generals knew that they were outnumbered, and so uh, such case it was you know, better to go into a, a, a kind of an even um, uh, plain, if you will, not say an open field, but this would be, hey, everyone's at disadvantage here. Uh, but you'll see the more skilled army um, actually conquering and winning. And so David's men fighting in the force opposed to an open field. Um, so they had more of an equal chance as adversity of the uh, forest causes problems really on both sides. Uh, but here's the thing. Don't underestimate the God who's behind all of this. God wanted David back on the throne again and was behind this particular victory. So that's the thing we always got to keep in mind. Verse 7 specifically states that David's men won this battle uh, decisively. And as we could reason here, David's men were wise. They were experienced in battle, hard and fighting men, and Absalom's army was no match to that. 
And so the tactic of Absalom used the battle of fighting in the force of Ephraim showed his inexperience and led to defeat of his army. So he had no experience. He, he wasn't developed for this yet. And so we can see the outcome here. So this forest was thick, and Absalom's men would be uh, getting backed up into uh, and becoming sitting ducks, if you will, of David's men. And the phrase uh, would devour, or woods devoured, it seems to imply that God fought for David in an unusual way. Kind of reminds me, I think it's uh, Narnia where the uh, woods and the trees, they kind of come out of the ground and start moving around, if that's the movie I'm thinking of. You know, nothing's too hard for the Lord to use creation, you know, for his advantage. And so, uh, but the soldiers uh, loyal to Absalom seem to be swallowed up by the woods. Verse 9 continues, And then Absalom met the servants of David. <coughs> Absalom rode on a mule. And the mule went under the thick branch in the tabernacle tree, and his head caught between the tabernacle. So he's left hanging between heaven and earth. And this mule was under him, went on. So it's like it didn't seem like it phased him, or good riddance. So it seemed like a, a scene of a, of a movie here, you know. And, and you visualize Absalom leading his army. He's on this particular mule. And uh, the mule's perhaps maybe in full gallop. He goes under these low trees. And you see Absalom's head get stuck in the branches. And he's left hanging in midair. It kind of reminds you of a scene from uh, Return of the Jedi with Luke Skywalker chased through the woods of Endor. And the Imperial Stormtroopers hit, the, hit those trees and they explode and die. And so here, <clears throat> the servants of Absalom were getting clobbered by the trees somehow. Well, Absalom's head got in one of the, the trees, uh, and we always say that it was the thick and beautiful hair that uh, got him hung up. <clears throat> that long hair of Absalom had been a distinctive mark of pride, um, became his means of his undoing. And remember that we read several chapters ago that when he cut his hair once a year, it weighed up to about five pounds or close to two kilos. So it was a, a heavy set of hair. Um, and so the text says it was his head. Uh, historian Josephus' uh, account says that his hair, and that kind of seems to make sense. Either way, uh, this is what's happening. Uh, many commentators, again, go back to the physical description of Absalom back in chapter 14, uh, where say it was his thick hair that weighed uh, when it was cut. And now Absalom's stuck in this tree. His hair, again, could have been tangled up uh, as well. Um, so that's probably what, what's happening as well. But the pun here is that Absalom's big head was his downfall. Uh, so in a sense, the death of Absalom was due to his ego and his pride. And a great lesson here is uh, get a haircut before going into battle. Uh, when you go into boot camp, you know, and join the military, the first thing they do is shave your head, right? A lesson learned here. Uh, verse 10 continues. And so there's a certain man uh, who saw and told Joab and says, I saw Absalom hanging in the tapness tree. So Joab said to the man who told him, <coughs> you just saw him? Why didn't you strike him there to the ground? I would have given you ten shekels of silver and a belt. Ooh, <laughs> a belt. <laughs> but the man said to Joab, I thought there to receive a thousand shekels of silver in my hand. I would not raise my hand against the king's son, for in our hearing the king commanded you and Abishai and Ittai, saying, Beware lest anyone touch uh, the young man Absalom, otherwise I would have dealt falsely from my own life. For there is nothing hidden from the king. You and yourself would have set yourself against me. Now, we don't see what happened between verses 9 and 10. Perhaps maybe there is a conversation between this man and Absalom. And so this man asked Absalom, hey, homie, what's up? Then Absalom just said, oh, I'm just hanging in there. <laughs> Anyways, <clears throat> so Absalom could have cut his hair from the tree if that was what was holding him there uh, and, and escape, but he didn't. Knowing Absalom, he <clears throat> perhaps simply tried to free himself with his hair and all, but um, he was trying to keep his vanity and end up losing his life in this situation. And so we see these verses, uh, this interesting exchange and what we can make of it. Well, the first thing <clears throat> I would suggest is that we can't be sure who's right. On one hand, 
uh, you think that Joab was right because Absalom is a rebel. On the other hand, you think the certain man was right because he was obeying the direct order from the king. So it was a, a difficult situation here. So this unarmed soldier, or unnamed soldier, uh, did no harm. He didn't free Absalom, nor did he let him escape. So uh, you can't find fault with him there. And so Joab had a greater authority than the soldier than to uh, make a field decision himself. And so uh, it's kind of hard to find fault there. Uh, one of the lessons that we can learn from this is the two soldiers can, can look at the same situation uh, and, uh, or, or we would say ministry in that sense differently depending on the roles and maturity. As long as the Lord work uh, gets done in a way that honors and glorifies him is the key. So you can approach the situation in the same, uh, you know, with different perspectives in mind. The sad part is the exchange between the soldier and Joab. While Joab is immediately and unnecessary critical uh, for his part, the soldier describes Joab as someone who uh, won't support his troops uh, when push comes to stop, shove. So he should have been more supportive there. And so they had this awful uh, partnership even though they fought side by side. Part of being uh, battle tested is not just uh, getting the job done, it's getting the job done with honor and respect and love toward each other. And so how we minister is just as important as the ministry itself. And the fact a lot happens, I think it's designed by the Lord to test our relationships rather than the results that we're trying to achieve. So we might be trying to do something, but the Lord's more focused on our relationships than getting the results done or getting the work done. Uh, and so when this was reported to Joab, the general wondered why this man didn't immediately kill Absalom. And so the man replied he didn't do it out of obedience and faithfulness to David. So the military belt uh, was kind of a chief ornament of the soldier, so it was a highly prized in all the nations at the time. It'd be kind of uh, wearing a big, you know, rodeo champion-like buckle, you know, that uh, it kind of, uh, you, it was a prize to be won, uh, an honor to have. And from what this man said to Joab, uh, the last sentence, we see the character of Joab who was cunning and manipulative, you know, very similar to as you see with Absalom. Uh, verse 14 goes on to tell us, then Joab says, I cannot linger with you. And he took three spears in his hand and thrust them through Absalom's heart while he was still alive in the midst of the Tabernacle tree. So in the King James, New King James spear is the, uh, there, it reads darts, uh, and the ESV says javelins. Um, so whatever the size is, isn't important. Uh, the word dart there kind of reminds us of the fact that Satan describes as these fiery darts of the enemy, as Ephesians 6, uh, 16 tells us. Uh, and that's one of the small clues that we can see Absalom as a type of uh, uh, Satan as well, just hanging between heaven and earth. Uh, he's the prince of the power of the air, uh, as he's also been described. Um, verse 15 goes on to say, Then the ten young men who bore uh, Joab's armor surrounded Absalom, struck and killed him and so joab blew a trumpet and the people returned from pursuing israel for joab hill held the people back and they took absalom cast him into a large pit in the woods and they laid a very large heap of stones over him then all israel fled everyone to his own tent so joab told the man that if he had killed absalom then he would have been rewarded by joab However, the man told Joab, you know, this is what the king said concerning Absalom, that if he was killed, uh, that it could even lead to his own death. And so Joab didn't want to argue with the man, so he immediately uh, went to where uh, Absalom was and, and pierced his heart through these with these spears. So the ten men that were with Joab end up finishing off uh, Absalom, and then they blow the trumpet. The trumpets there were used to direct the troops' movement, and it's an important announcement, you know, how, however they sounded it out. And apparently there was a, a, a trumpet code uh, for that the battle's over. I just killed Absalom. So whatever that code was and however they sounded the trumpet. And so David's troop acting as one returned. And it may sound obvious, but uh, when it comes to serving the Lord, we need to be clear about what we're doing. We need to communicate with one another, know our objectives, and work together to achieve them. And it will be good at this point, you know, for us to discover, uh, to talk a little bit more about Joab. 
Joab, as you know, had been caring about this terrible secret, uh, the secret that caused him to become uh, disgruntled and um, embittered against David. Uh, Joab, as you know, received the note from David had to have uh, Uriah the Hittite uh, killed uh, because of his adultery with uh, Bathsheba and that she was pregnant. So, um, so the secret had caused Joab uh, to lose respect for David. So you can see how now Joab is now, even though he's one of his generals, was now you know, going to go against what David said. Uh, so Joab had once been loyal and um, a good general for David. However, his time, uh, his interested over time, it continued to become more self-interested and selfish versus I'm, gonna, I'm here to support David. So he's no longer looking out uh, for David's best interest, but rather his own. So Joab forced, um, you know, was a, a fierce and, and a ruthless warrior. Uh, and and he, he lacked empathy, he lacked compassion, uh, or any kind of spirituality or sensitivity to uh, others and to life. And so he had no uh, right to blatantly go against the king's orders uh, and, and kill the king's son. Um, and, and by doing this, we know at this point he had no respect for the king. He didn't care what David's orders were or what David's wishes were. He's going to do his own thing. And we shouldn't look at what Joab and, and, and killing Absalom and think, oh, he did a great favor for Israel. Uh, although in doing so, he went against, um, you know, uh, David's decision. And again, um, you know, God is in control. God could have worked it out in his perfect timing as well. But his act was one of treachery against the king. And so Joah really needed to uh, be stopped. Uh, however, he wasn't uh, so firmly entrenched in power uh, that David didn't know how to pull the plug on him. Uh, he shouldn't have placed him in that position. And since Absalom is now dead, the insurrection is now over. And knowing that Joah blew the trumpet has caused his uh, t uh, army to um, uh, reunite. And so Absalom's army scattered and returned to all their different homes as well. So to show uh, disrespect for Absalom, they threw his body into a pit. And as a reminder of, of that, because the insurrection and the rebellion against his father, plus the murder of his uh, brother Amnon, um, he deserved to be stoned, as Deuteronomy 21 tells us. And so they threw stones upon his body. So it wasn't just to bury him, but is also significant. This is what should have happened to him to begin with. And you ever wonder if uh, there was a thought in Absalom's head, you know, you know what? I'm probably not going to get away with this. Anytime you go against your parents, you know, you know, it never turns out well. You know, it's a scriptural command. And, um, you know, so his rebellion is not going to end well. You know, anyone who's in rebellion doesn't end well. I wonder if that ever hit his mind or he's just going to continue to do what he's going to do regardless of the uh, consequences he didn't care. Anyways, verse 18 gets us some insight into Absalom, and it says, Now Absalom in his lifetime had taken up a pillar for himself, which is in the king's valley. For he said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. And he called the pillar after his own name. And to this day, it's called Absalom's Monument. So notice here that he had set up this pillar uh, in his own name, this own monument. Uh, he did have children, but they obviously must have died before this period of time. Uh, and so he ended up uh, building this pillar for himself to be remembered. And so Absalom had done really no good deeds and, and uh, no good for that matter. And so he, he didn't really deserve to be remembered in this sense. So he was just an egomaniac. Uh, who had not been stopped, uh, you know, uh, in you know, in this situation, he would have continued on uh, to be a dictator, a tyrant over Israel. And so Absalom is what we call uh, a, a legend in his own mind. Uh, so having uh, no living sons to carry on after him, he commemorated himself by erecting this particular monument. So Absalom, as we mentioned, he did have sons, but they they must have died before this period of time. 
And how sad it is when men feel the need to establish something to keep their name in remembrance. Now, sometimes it's not them that does it, but it's others behind the, hey, we want to honor this person. Um, but uh, how wonderful it is that Jesus remembers the works of all his sons and daughters. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10 says, For God is not unjust to forget your works and your labor of love, which you have shown uh, toward his name, that you should have ministered to the saints and do minister. So God keeps track of everything. You know, whether you're, you're, you're known or unknown, he sees it all. So we don't have to set up memorials for ourselves. Uh, we just need to live for the Lord, allowing our lives to impact others. And if God wants us to be remembered by people, may it be because we gave ourselves away, not because we try to make sure we're trying to be remembered. And so we can instill in our children a knowledge and love for the Lord. And so we can serve the Lord with our time, with our talents, uh, with the things, storing up ourselves an inheritance in heaven uh, and obtaining a, a spiritual offspring. So it's important to be battle ready to be battle tested each and every day. So it's this development that goes on in our lives until we're in glory. Our goal should not to have people remember us. Our goal should to have people remember Jesus. And uh, it is my heart's and my desire that the ministries here at the church be done in such a way that the uh, it's Jesus being glorified and him being magnified and people being connected to uh, the Lord, not to the church or to um, any anyone else. It's about Jesus. Now, verse 19, the scene changes and the focus is on David. It says, then uh, Ahimez, uh, the son of Zodak, says, let me run now and take the news to the king and how the Lord has avenged him of his enemies. And so Joab said to him, you shall not take the news this day, for you shall take the news another day. But today you shall take no news because the king's son is dead. So why not him? because the king's son is dead was the message and so Joab was probably having several things in mind here first of all this kind of news could get you killed if the king was in the wrong frame of mind uh, that old saying don't kill the messenger uh, that that did happen at that time they did kill the messengers because they didn't like to hear the report and then secondly maybe Joab knew Ahimaaz uh, would also be unable to deliver the message uh, in its entirety in fact uh, when Ahimaaz uh, does have the opportunity to tell David he actually withholds the truth about Absalom so even though he had the opportunity, he doesn't come through with that. So one of the first things to do and assess about our serving the Lord at home or at work or in the church or in the world uh, is that it's up to the Lord to assign our various tasks. Um, we set ourselves up for failure when we assist in doing something that God has not called us to do. Uh, and so people have their own ambition to do their own thing instead of what the Lord is calling them to do. Um, and so we got to leave it in his hands and, and see how he uh, confirms that calling in a person's life. Uh, verse 21, then Joab said to the Cushite, Go and tell the king what you have seen. So the Cushite bowed himself to Joab and ran. So the Cushite bowed to Joab and ran. The Cushite, uh, we see several qualities here. Number one, you see humility. The very fact that he wasn't named uh, reminds us of a task oriented and not worried about recognition. He's just an unnamed servant. So it doesn't matter if you get thanked or not for doing whatever. Um, he was immediately uh, available. Uh, so he is a messenger who understood that he might be called upon any moment. Same thing for all of us. You know, we never know when we have an opportunity to serve and to minister uh, to others. And so we should have that sense that God wants to use us right where we're at uh, when we're ready. And so that's why we always need to be ready uh, in season and out of season. You know, even if we're at the shops, you know, we have an opportunity to minister to someone, to pray with someone. So we always want to be available uh, for those promptings of the Lord. We also see that he was submissive and that uh, he, he asked no question. He just bowed himself and went on. He didn't have to worry about debating anything. How should I say it or anything like that? And perhaps most of all, he is willing to lay down his life, um, you know, at, at this task. Uh, what lies at, Even if his life was, you know, could have been you know, killed. Uh, and, and as we said, that the news could have gotten you killed that day. Uh, you, you and I have the good news. We have the gospel to deliver. It can literally get us killed in other countries around the world. Here in, in Australia and, and probably in America, it just kills opportunity for popularity or advancement. When people know that you're uh, a Christian or you get silenced, but um, 
in uh, other Islamic countries, you end up being uh, killed for being a Christian. Uh, in fact, there's more people dying uh, as Christians today in this century than any of the previous 2,000 years of Christianity. And still, we're to humble ourselves, be available to the Lord, bowing to his leading. Verse 22, then Ahimez, son of Zodak, said again to Joab, but whatever happens, please let me also run after the Cushite. And so Joab says, why will you run, my son, since you have no news ready? No news ready kind of seems to mean that he had nothing to add uh, to uh, what the Cushite would say. Uh, there's nothing but just a duplicate effort. And sadly, this is a kind of a, um, you know, it's, it's a, what happens in today's society. There's always duplicates. Uh, and I like what uh, K.P. Yohan, founder of Gospel for Asia, which he does a lot of uh, work mainly in India, uh, and he's got a unique, he's wrote a book called Revolution and World Missions. And, uh, but he wrote this and says that when Christians are so busy uh, mumbling uh, to themselves about the things we already know. Most of the world has never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, we, uh, he, he means to have a tendency to uh, become ingrown. Um, so there's times that there's just duplicate works that's happening in Christianity instead of a new work, a new location. Uh, there are people are building on another man's foundation or how many churches do you need in one location? Sometimes it's a zoning situation, I guess. Sometimes it's a building availability. But uh, there's places where there's churches right next to each other. You know, that, that's a duplication that doesn't need to happen. That should be pl places where there is no church. Go, go plant a church there. You know, uh, so those are some, some things. And so uh, we need to keep establishing uh, new works if we can, uh, instead of duplicating what we're already doing. And there's times that uh, uh, there is a need for a, a duplication of a church uh, in a location, you know, because there's a, uh, and every church is unique, every church has its own dynamics. Um, but, you know, the struggle that we see is when they're built right next to each other. You know, if I don't like this church, I'll go to that church next door. You know, they do this, they do that, you know. So you have such a plethora of different style of churches. I know um, a, a street in Irvine, California, and you have about five or six churches right next to each other. You know, you have a cult, which is the, the Mormon church there, the, ch ch uh, the Mormons, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And then you have a Lutheran church, and then you have a Baptist church, and you have a, a charismatic church. And they're all in the same street right next to each other. You know, it's like, why don't you find a new location, you know, to, to go instead of right next to each other? Anyways, verse 23 goes on to say, but whatever happens, he says, let me run. So he said to him, run. Then uh, Amaz, uh, also, by the way, the plane out of, outran the Cushite. So as uh, Ahimaz uh, insisted, and, and he had this real zeal uh, to serve the Lord, to be uh, commended, but it's also, uh, you know, tempered by uh, obedience. Um, because he, you know, and I want to do something, uh, th there's, you know, there's this uh, push, uh, his own ambition. I want to be the one uh, to, you know, and, um, you know, he, he wanted to do something. Uh, there's no indication that he ought to do it. Just because you could doesn't mean you should do it. Uh, anyways, Job let him go. Uh, we can't be sure why. Uh, maybe he thought the Cushite uh, uh, had an adequate head start, and by the time that Amos arrived there, there'd be nothing to tell. And um, I'll tell you one thing, that it's hard to say no at sometimes. Uh, especially to a persistent person, um, you know, because you feel bad for them. Uh, and it's still better to say no if you're convinced that no is the answer. Um, you're always amazed of when you see the clips of whether it's Australian Idol, British Got Talent, American Idol, whatever those shows are, uh, that people who think they are talented are awful, how they make it there. You know, and um, they, they generally uh, are hurt when they're told you have no talent. Right? Somewhere along the way, friends and family had told the person yes uh, when they should have said no. Right? But it's, it makes good entertainment. But some of these things should not have happened. No, you're not good enough. Okay? It's okay. You know, that's not your talent. And so, anyways, I don't know where I went with that thought. But uh, Amaz outrun the Kushite because he knew a shortcut. You know? 
uh, and, and so he ends up getting to, to David. Uh, obviously, the application for us is whatever we do for the Lord, uh, what, whatever we do, uh, we're not to take shortcuts. You know, that uh, there's, a, there's a process, there's a reason behind sometimes the delays. It's for our development, uh, and there's no shortcuts to what the Lord wants to do. Uh, and this could apply to our personal and devotional lives. There's no court shortcuts to deepening our walk with the Lord. So we need to spend time with Him alone. Um, you know, getting ahead, pushing our way forward is not a substitute for personal discipline. There are no shortcut principles that applies to our activities with the Lord. So we just got to do the right things, um, you know, thoroughly and, and finish what you start. And uh, anyone can start off strong. It's how you finish. You know, we get a lot of people that say, I'm going to do this. And, you know, they're, they're consistent for about a week or two and then they die off. You know, it's the consistency finishing to keep uh, being faithful week in, week out. Uh, verse 24. Now David was sitting between two gates. And the watchman went up to the roof over the gate, to the wall, lifted his eyes and looked, and there was a man running alone. And the watchman cried out and told the king, and the king says, if he is alone, there is news in his mouth. And he came rapidly and drew near. Then the watchman saw another man running, and the watchman called to another gatekeeper and says, there's another man running alone. And the king says, he also brings news. So a lone runner had a good sign. For one thing, it meant that the army is not retaliating or, or retreating. And the second runner indicate there is additional news. So in other words, there's something that had significant change uh, since the first runner has been dispatched, something important, and it was really just a, a, a little confusing to, to see the two uh, messengers. You know, sometimes in, in some cases it can be better to support um, the, the first messenger rather than send the second messenger with the same news. Uh, and we see this sometimes in, in the mission field. Uh, you look for someone to support who's already doing the work uh, and that's already delivering the gospel message rather than trying to establish a new thing. You know, sometimes they just need reinforcement to make that work even stronger. Um, and I get this all the time where I get people instead of coming alongside an existing church plant or or us for that matter they want to go out and do their own thing and that's fine if that's what you really believe but not once have those works continued not once have they um you know been established and, and continued on they've all folded within months or years uh they don't continue on when you had an opportunity to uh, be involved in established work to come along and be part of that reinforcement you know and not to say that god didn't use that situation or opportunity to develop them or someone else that came alongside uh, god can do anything in spite of that um, but there's opportunity to reinforce a work that's already being done um, you know but again it's you know it depends on the situation and the leading of the lord Verse 27 goes on to say, so the watchman says, I think the running of the first uh, is like the running of, of Hemaz, uh, the son of Zodak. And the king says he's a good man and he comes with good news. And so Hemaz called out and said to the king, all is well. And then he bowed down with his face to the earth before the king and says, blessed be the Lord God um, who has delivered the men who raised up their hand against the Lord my king. The king says, is the young man Absalom safe? And Amaz said, When Joab <clears throat> sent the king's servant, and me your servant, and I saw with great tumult, but I did not know what was about. And the king says, Turn aside and stand here. So he turned aside and stood there. So initially, Joab had um, said no to Ahamaz because he knew David would um, interpret it as a sign from Absalom being alive and that all is well. And uh, he didn't want to give David any false hope uh, when delivering the news. And so when Amos finally uh, was called upon to deliver it, he blew it. He didn't tell him the truth. He couldn't bring himself to tell the king that Absalom is dead. And so David's actions are uh, also complex and, and divided here. Uh, he should have been uh, primarily concerned about the welfare of the nation. Uh, and then secondly, about Absalom, who was a traitor. But he uh, speaks uh, as a father who uh, has this divided and torn heart. Verse 31, then the Cushite came 
And the Cushite says, There is good news, my lord the king, for the Lord has avenged you uh, this day of those who rose against you. And the king said to the Cushite, Is young man Absalom safe? And so the Cushite answers, May the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise against you do uh, harm be like that young man. So I can't imagine a more of a concise, more accurate way, compassionate way to deliver this message. And again, this is where um, he was telling him the truth without just blatantly saying, yeah, he's dead, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's a more of a compassionate way here. And uh, again, David, uh, who previously slew men uh, who brought him bad news to death. Uh, and again, back in chapter 4 of, of King Saul, uh, Joab must have felt that Amos was probably too valuable initially to have his life risked to bring the good news. And so this is why he sent the Cushite, because uh, he could be easily more sacrificed. Some have suggested that Ahimaaz uh, wanted uh, to, to be the one to break the news so that he could um, do it in the gentlest way to make uh, um, the, the, the most sense. And uh, th this would explain why Amaz beat uh, you know, around the bush when David asked if Absalom was dead. Uh, perhaps, again, Abs uh, Joab was afraid since Amahaz uh, was a priest and feared the Lord when he told David of what had happened that he might have uh, cast uh, Joab in a bad light. Uh, so there's this uh, complexities of, of what is happening here. Uh, he might have feared God more than man, and the uh, truth uh, of the account of how Joab had disobeyed the king's orders and initially killed Absalom, thrusting the three spears through Absalom's heart. So David, as we see here, he is sitting between uh, two gates uh, in the Ephraimite city uh, with a watchman waiting anxiously to hear the news of how the battle had gone between his fighting men and Absalom's army. So when David and his men saw the single runner come, and then a second one, David knew that the battle had gone well with his men uh, and that he had fled the situation, um, you know. And so the, the news is now coming to David. How is he going to respond? So now we start to see in verse 33 that the king is going to be moved deeply. He's going to mourn over it. Notice that the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And he went and he said thus, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died in your place, O oh Absalom, my son. So the idea of being deeply moved or in some translation would say shaken or overcome with emotion, uh, David was so crippled by the news of his son's death that he was physically and emotionally shaken through his entire body. Uh, and, and notice David's cry, if only I had died in his place. If you think about that, this son who, uh, would, uh, who, who ran David off the throne, this is the son who organized the insurrection and the rebellion. This is the son that wanted to kill David. It, it shows the love that David, as his father, overshadowed all that uh, events. Verse uh, 1 of chapter 19 continues, and we'll go up to verse 8 uh, in this chapter. And so Joab was told, Behold, the king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. And so the victory of that day turned into the mourning for all the people. And for the people heard it and said that the king is grieved for his son. And the people stole back the city of that day. And the people are ashamed to steal away uh, when they flee in battle. And the king covered his face. And the king cried out with a loud voice, <coughs> My son Absalom, Absalom, uh, my son, my son. And then Joab came to the house to the king and says, Today you have disgraced all your servants who today have saved your life and the lives of your sons and daughters and the lives of your wives and your li lives of your concubines and that you love your enemies and hate your friends for you have declared today that uh, you regard neither princesses nor servants for today I perceive that if Absalom had lived all of us died today then it would have pleased you well now therefore arise and go out and speak comfort to your servants for I swear to you by the Lord if you do not go out not one will stay with you this night, and this will be worse for you than all the evil that has befallen from you from your youth until now. So again, the, the, the first three words are important here. Again, Joab was told. 
So the rest of the paragraph is what uh, Joab was told. Uh, he was told that David, again, he was sitting around, he was crying about the death of his son, uh, and, and the, the morale of the army is now in a kind of this low, despite the fact that they won the war. The morale of the ki uh, king is, a affection to, uh, is going to affect the troops. Uh, so uh, they're going to carry on that, that um, attitude. And, and this is a, a good lesson in leadership, is how we act affects others around us. How we act affects the others around us. And so David grieves. He wails excessively over the loss of his son. And this causes the army to be discouraged until finally Joab comes to the king and rebukes him uh, for the discouraging uh, of his army after their valiant victory in the battle. He was more concerned about uh, the loss of, of Absalom. Now, there's some legitimate reasons for David to display uh, the, the level of grief uh, upon hearing the loss of his son. Again, uh, we, we could and we should expect David to have expressed sorrow over uh, his son. Any parent would expect to do likewise, right? There's still your son regardless. Uh, I, I don't believe uh, that Absalom was right with the Lord, and that's probably what uh, David was thinking uh, as well when he died. Um, you know, probably doubted Absalom's salvation, where he's at with the Lord, so that was obviously causing some grief. And again, when, when David heard about when his baby died uh, with Bathsheba, that the baby would, uh, you know, that he would be able to go to him one day. Um, so he was okay to hear that particular news, but he doesn't know about the condition of uh, Absalom's salvation. He knew that himself, because of his sin, he is responsible for his uh, son's death. On the other hand, there, there's a large um, illegitimate uh, reasons for David having this excessive grief upon hearing the loss. David's sorrow over his son was excessive and done uh, at the expense of any feelings uh, of those under his command and leadership. So how did it make those people feel? Uh, these, his men were humiliated thinking that they've done wrong. And they displeased the king by their victory. And so David was placing his son kind of like uh, in the place of an idol uh, above the Lord. And calling, um, you know, his calling for David as a leader above the people. So the first commandment tells us that we're not to have any idols in our life. So obviously Absalom must have been an idol in David's life. And to, David was letting his grief overcome him uh, so that he cannot really function uh, as uh, he should have been able to as, uh, as a leader. And, and here's the hard part as a leader, is that leaders have to set aside their feelings in order to function uh, effectively. Uh, they have to care about others and helping others and encourage them and deal with their own feelings uh, at, at a different time. So you put the people first. Uh, Absalom was a, a wicked son uh, and really had no redeemable qualities about him uh, in order uh, for David to really love him as he did. Uh, and again, we must remember that none of us really have any redeemable qualities uh, that should cause uh, the Lord to love us, but he does. It's that unconditional love. Uh, David had, uh, seems like, this unreasonable affection <clears throat> for Absalom. And one of the signs of spiritual maturity in a Christian's life is when we begin to uh, get rid of any inordinate affection in our life. Uh, by inordinate, I mean something that you're placing above the Lord. Um, and it could be anything. It could be objects. It could be uh, possessions. It could be people, uh, you know, um, so a number of things. And so that's an unhealthy uh, situation in a believer's life. We see it happening all the time uh, where people are elevating pastors and teachers and authors uh, in an unhealthy position. And, um, and so, so that does happen in, in the Christian churches, unfortunately. But Absalom, <clears throat> this boy of David, uh, had committed horrible sins. And though uh, it was natural for David to have mourned for his death, David should never have gone on and on and on in his mourning, um, you know, for uh, the one um, in the situation. So it does have a time and place, but don't, don't, it doesn't have to be excessive uh, in this situation. Uh, in spite of all that, again, Absalom, uh, he was against his David. David grieved over his son. So there's a natural thing, but also was an unhealthy uh, what he was doing uh, through this. Uh, and again, as five times David says, my son, my son. 
uh, he felt so deeply. He, he took responsibility because it was his responsibility in the end. Um, and, and so uh, realize that our un ungodliness will rub off onto our children. Uh, the rebellion caused uh, great grief. And, uh, and uh, so we need to have the understanding. Again, this is why we're always praying for our children to walk in the ways of the Lord all the days of their life or for them to come to the Lord. You know, so, um, but it does grieve us when uh, family members are not walking with the Lord. Um, and it just, it, the, the simple answer is to surrender, but there's the free will of man. They have to choose to uh, do that. Uh, one commentary says that David Sarr shows us that it isn't uh, enough that parents train their children to be godly. They must train themselves in godliness. So it starts with us as, as parents. We cannot stand in the presence of uh, suffering without learning some solemn lessons of parental responsibility uh, it has to teach, uh, not merely just training our children, but uh, in, e in uh, e earlier training ourselves for their sakes. So it starts with us as parents. You know, we do the best we can. We got to continue to surrender uh, everything to the Lord. Uh, so Absalom, though, he's still responsible for his own wrongdoing. So he's not off the hook. Yeah, David had a, uh, a part to play in this, but ultimately Absalom, as an adult, is fully responsible for everything. And again, as Romans 8.28 is still true, even in the midst of this kind of pain over our wrongdoing, over uh, our sins of our children, again, God works all things out uh, for our good. And so when it comes down to it, as he said, he would rather die instead of him. What father, what parent would not rather die in the place of their children? We'd all say we would, you know. Um, but uh, part of us, uh, you know, can't fault uh, David for his reaction. We still love our children when they're disobedient, when they rebel against our leading, uh, when they cause trouble. Uh, we still hang in there for them. Uh, we, we certainly understand David's heart as a father here, so we can't fault him for that. Um, but again, he was kind of... Um, putting that role as father above his role as a king. He needed to be king in this situation. There's a time to uh, be the, uh, in the morning there. Verse 8 closes out the section. Then the king arose and sat in the gate, and uh, they all told the people, saying, There is the king sitting in the gate. So all the people came before the king, for everyone of Israel had fled to his tent. So this is one of those verses that speaks volumes if you understand a little bit about that culture. Uh, the, the sentence here that the king got up, took a seat in the gate, uh, the gateway there. So the translation would be um, an understanding is that the king stopped sitting around, uh, feeling sorry for himself, and he went back to work. That's, that's a better way of understanding that uh, phrase there. Uh, the gateway there is really the entrance of the city. This is where the leader sat at that time. Um, and what is not as said is the implied by this verse that David went back to being king. He uh, uh, re resumed his leadership. And so those who followed him understood the grief of David. Um, but at the same time, David needed to show gratitude for those who followed as well. And sometimes a simple gesture like what David is doing here gets the message out, you know, without even having to say things. And just like that, things were put right. Uh, it may not happen as quickly for you as it did for David, but uh, you nevertheless are to be encouraged to walk in the Spirit and, um, you know, and, and whatever we're dealing with in our life, uh, to, to surrender it, to keep um, you know, surrendering things to the Lord, to live up to your responsibilities, uh, um, depending upon the Lord and His empowering in our life. And I like what it says in 1 Corinthians 16, 13. It says, be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Uh, great exhortation. You know, we need a man up, woman up, if you will. Now, if you find the message of the gospel you're sent to deliver, um, what will be better received, better understood by those um, you've been sent to affect for good for the Lord. And uh, the Lord places us where he wants us to be. But there's a character here. There's a development here. There's a process uh, in growing and maturing in our uh, walk with the Lord. And um, it's it's a uh, it's a day by day experience uh, with uh, our relationship with Him. Uh, we learn from these lessons, you know. Uh, so there's times it's you got to grieve, and there's other times uh, it's time to rise up and get back to work. You know. So there's a time and place for everything. Amen. 
Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for your word. We pray that you continue to mold us and shape us to be the men and women you've called us to be. We thank you uh, that you're in control, that you are sovereign of everything that happens to us in our life and our situations, those who um, need direction, those who need healing, that you would touch them, that you'd speak to them, that you minister to them those who need to come to know you as Savior and Lord, that you would draw them by the power of your Spirit, uh, that they would uh, turn to you uh, and receive you as Savior and Lord before it's too late. So we thank you that you're in control. We thank you for your word. Thank you for this opportunity uh, to gather together, to study, to learn, to grow, uh, to be uh, molded uh, into your image. So we worship you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.